Sam Quinn Lemley with Secrets of the Stage, the place where you'll learn the latest in performance, public speaking, and communication. We have a wonderful show lined up for you today. It's a little different. It's the creativity and speaking and painting and connecting with primates. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robin Huffman, and I'm here to tell you a little story. I spent a whole career in corporate interior design until I fell in love and left the field. I love sunshine. The day sparkles when there is sunshine. Sunshine makes me smile, makes me laugh. Seeing sunshine in the morning makes me jump out of bed. Sunshine is warm on my face warm on my body. Sunshine is the orphan baby baboon I raised in Africa. It's been a lifelong dream of mine to commune with wild animals and that's why I volunteered at a primate sanctuary in Cameroon. I want to tell you about a day of raising sunshine but first I'll tell you how he came to me. It's 2013 and I'm volunteering when the veterinarian sets a long, narrow wooden crate in front of me and says, we've brought you a New Year's gift. I'm thrilled, but sad. It means another primate orphaned. I open the lid, staring up at me with shiny, coal black eyes wide open, is this little creature, an infant baboon less than three months old. His face is creamy pink and wrinkled. Two perfect heart-shaped nostrils and only four teeth. His spiky, umber-colored hair is velvety soft as I pick him up. He fits in the palms of my hands. He is mine to care for and protect now. I name him Sunshine. The day begins at first blush of light in the pitch black of the night, I'll have gotten up several times to bottle feed Sunshine, who sleeps in a cage next to my bed. He doesn't always want to go back to sleep alone, as typically he would be enfolded tightly in the arms of his mother. So that's when I have to summon up some tough love, and I poke my fingers through the door of his cage. I'll even fall asleep like that. He'll fall asleep too eventually, either sucking on my fingers or pressed up against them, hungry for that innate primal contact. At first light, Sunshine is awake and ready to play. When I open the door to the cage, he leaps into my arms or attaches himself to my leg like Velcro. I manage to dress, prying him off one leg and attaching him to the other so I can slip on my socks and my pants. After a bottle, it's time for breakfast. So I carry him over to the volunteer kitchen where I stockpile a bounty of fresh fruits and vegetables for my young primates. It's fascinating watching Sunshine eat. He's so uncoordinated. He looks competent at first until he drops the bit of food I've given him and can't manage to pick it up. Or as he's trotting towards the cat who fascinates him and just tips over. I understand that sometimes Sunshine gets upset, and while it's a bit heart-wrenching, I can't help but laugh at the same time. He flings himself into his hammock, just his head peeking out, and stares at me indignantly, or in a move that's meant to summon his mother. He lifts his head, his eyebrows go up, his ears and his hair actually flatten against his head, and he moves, it looks and sounds pitiful, and it's meant to. And that's usually followed by a convulsive ah, ah. At first, Sunshine interacts only with me because he's quarantined, but then I introduce him to his first friends, Nunu and Abida. They're monkeys, and they're a year older than him, but they're half his size. When I first put them together in the cage, Sunshine, so happy, lunges towards them with his play face, mouth wide open, and that scares them, so they dash off to the other end of the cage. And then, angry that he frightened them, they come back and bite him. 
Sunshine doesn't understand. Eventually, they realize he's just a big, goofy baby, like the cartoon character, Baby Huey, and they become good friends. After chores and cutting fresh leaves and dinner, it's bedtime for baby baboons. My goal is to put him to sleep stress-free. First, we chase each other around the room, both of us laughing. Then he climbs. And as part of that game, I coax him to hop in and out of his sleeping cage, hoping that he will get drowsy and just stay there. When that doesn't work, I put him on my foot and he instinctively wraps himself around my ankle. I pace the room, swinging my leg like a pendulum, a carnival ride for sunshine. It never fails fast asleep in minutes. I gently pry him off my leg and I place him in his waiting bed of soft cloths. Good night, sunshine. After that, I leave and go back to America. And one year later, I come back and he is thriving with his own kind. I visit the enclosure, the forest enclosure where the baboons are, and I see a batch of young ones playing near the adults. I called out his name, sunshine, sunshine. The smallest, fuzziest one peels off from the group and comes and sits at the edge of the enclosure, just looking at me. I recognize that impish grin anywhere. And there he sits, just looking at me. He didn't call out, which made me very happy. It means he doesn't need me anymore. So he sits until I walk away. I have learned so much from these miraculous creatures. Not only are they infants that need our care, they're wild animals that need our protection, all of ours. We must be their voice in the world. And that is why, even in the darkest dark of the night, sunshine lights my path. Hi, I'm Quinn Lemley. Welcome to Secrets of the Stage, the place for the latest in performance, communication, and public speaking. Today we have a wonderful and unusual show for you. I have a painter and activist and primate surrogate, Robin Huffman. Welcome, Robin. Hi, Quinn, thank you. I, you, you have an unusual title, I have <laughs> yes. to say. You're so many things. You're, you're a painter, you're a communicator, you're an advocate. Tell your story. I, I, I just had the privilege of seeing Robin's show here in New York City, which we'll talk about and where they can see your paintings. But I, I have been dreaming of your stories and your paintings for a week now, and they're so powerful. Oh, thank you. So thank you. Tell us about your journey. I was, I was working in the corporate world, mm -hmm. um, and I just realized that I needed to step away from that for a bit and mm -hmm. do something visceral with more heart, mm -hmm. something to get my hands dirty and mm -hmm. just feel something organic. <laughs> so... <laughs> you can't get more organic than this. You're not going to believe this. Um, years earlier, when I first moved to New York, I had gone to a Barbara Scher lecture, and she told a story about a woman who became a surrogate gorilla mother. Now, I'd never really thought about gorillas. She knew about this before you even you yeah. knew it? Yes, absolutely. That's where the, the seed was planted in my mind. Oh my gosh. Because Barbara talks about how we must do what we love mm -hmm. and find our passion and that you can tell by the light in someone's eyes. Mm -hmm. And I, I choke up at even just thinking about what I've been privileged to get to do for the last mm -hmm. few years. So that idea, when I heard about a surrogate gorilla mother, I just thought, whoa, that sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so it must have just always been a seed in my mind. And I went to a week-long retreat with Barbara Scher on the island of Corfu. Oh, how wonderful. Just Barbara and 20 people to excavate our dreams. 
And even though I gave a talk on Eleanor of Aquitaine, and I talked about being a professional organizer, doing custom catering, running a bed and breakfast, doing shiatsu, you were restoring gonna your castle, medieval right? castles, everybody at the end of the week said, wow, you really love gorillas, don't you? <laughs> so where, where did the gorilla, so she planted the seed, that was a brilliant moment because I realized if this is what I'm broadcasting and mm -hmm. not even realizing it, I'd better pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I Googled gorilla orphan, gorilla rescue, and up popped a picture of a young woman with two gorillas and it said, do you want to volunteer? Oh my goodness. And I just said, yes. <laughs> and so you left, every, you left I, your job I, in New York? Well, first I took four months off. And I went to Cameroon to this primate sanctuary uh, because they had gorillas and chimps and uh, monkeys. I, I, all I knew was that they had gorillas mm -hmm. and that I certainly would be closer than if I were any place else. Wow. It's in the jungles of Cameroon in the Congo rainforest. Oh my and goodness. it's for orphans of the bushmeat and the illegal pet trade because the forests are being cut down mm -hmm. because of the demands of our Western world. Mm -hmm. And when you break the forest by penetrating it with logging roads, the hunters can come in and out and the populations are exploding. So there's more hunting escalating. And these orphans, uh, the parents get killed for meat, but the baby orphans that Where survive come to the sanctuaries if they're lucky. Wow. So. My very first day I, w I was there, I was handed a little blue-faced infant monkey named Maasai. Oh, she was flea-ridden, dehydrated, but she looked up at me and my life changed in that instant. Oh my goodness. Total left turn. <laughs> I've never felt so privileged and in the presence of such a miracle. Mm -hmm as that little primate and the other primate orphans. I, I spent three months there uh, and I felt so useful too. When you're mm -hmm. volunteering, you just, you get to help the heroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I resigned, I sold my condo and my car, put everything in storage wow. and two weeks after my condo sold, I was back in the forest in Cameroon. That's incredible. It, your show that is playing in New York right now, uh, and they're massive canvases of these uh, these primates that you worked with, a lot of them, you, you, you talked about Masa being flea ridden, and, but a lot of them have had wounds or were shot, mm -hmm. and you show that in yes. some of the paintings. Yes. Can you tell about why they're being hunted. I mean, I know the bushmeat or they're, they're mm -hmm. orphaned, but how you nurtured them back into health. We realize that we are just their temporary guardians. and You don't get too attached to them? Oh, I get very attached, but they are not ours and they are mm -hmm. not our pets. Mm -hmm. it, we are only there to step in to help save their lives because some other humans have taken the lives of their mother. Without you, they wouldn't survive, yes, right? Pretty much, yes. And in fact, um, f they figure that for every ape baby, like a gorilla or a chimp baby that survives and makes it to a sanctuary and lives, that at least 10 to 15 have been removed from the wild because only one out of five typically would live. And then for each baby, uh, at least one to two adults have been killed. The mother, certainly, and then usually the alpha of a group who is trying to protect the animals. After they're in the sanctuaries, can they go out into the wild again? In, at this time, in, most, in many cases, they will spend their, the rest of their lives in the sanctuary setting mm -hmm. because the forests are being cut down mm -hmm. at such a fast rate and the hunting is escalating mm -hmm. because a lot of it is linked to organized crime, um, just like the poaching that's mm -hmm. going on with the rhinos and the ivory and the lions and other parts of the world and in Asia where all the orangutans and the, mm -hmm. the forests are being cleared out of animals. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a very complicated question because you have to make sure there's 
that it would be safe out there and mm -hmm. that you aren't going to introduce anything to the wild mm -hmm. that like any disease. Your beautiful speech about sunshine, which our viewers watched, and it's so touching. It, it I've my awareness of of the primates has been much everywhere I look. You're hearing these stories. It was on 60 mm. Minutes. It's so important the work that you're doing. And what I love is that you're taking your artistic expression and you're telling these beautiful, moving stories, but with a purpose and a mission that's changing these primates' lives. And so I just think that that's so beautiful. Where, yeah, where is your you. art being shown? It's at the offices of Gensler, a design firm, in Rockefeller Center. And it's open through September 16th during office hours by, by appointment. appointment. So attached to these creatures. <laughs> Who was the one? Was it Sunshine or was it the first one that wouldn't let you go and that you had to take a shower? Oh, Masa. Ma with Masa. Yes. Because I actually didn't know I was learning about being a a caregiver for you have a to tell this story. No, it just they you know they would if they could they would spend two years on your body, without, <laughs> you know, and hope that you don't notice that they're <laughs> there because they need the nurturing. But at the same time, again, they don't belong to us, and mm -hmm. and it's we need to raise them so they're they're healthy, happy, independent, and strong. Mm -hmm so that they can go off and launch and be with their own kind. Mm -hmm. So there's a combination of tough love. They're not pets. They will never be pets. Mm -hmm. They are wild animals. And I decided that I would go be where they are from and that I'll be their pet oh, for as that. long as they need me. Each of the paintings, each of the faces are so expressive and they're so different, they're like us, they're, they're like humans. The, the face of the one when you get off the elevators and it's, it, it's, it's so dramatic, the way you have it. Um, Dylan. Dylan, can <laughs> yeah. you tell about Dylan's story? Yes, uh, Dylan, Dylan is a mandrel and I love mandrels. <laughs> what do you love about mandrels? <laughs> they're really lean and elegant that you'll see them sitting there like with their legs crossed and they just they sit there looking so human but but better than humans this and, face though is it, it's yeah. a haunting face yes, i mean yes. you can't get dylan's his eyes and and his nose when he came in he was a very scrawny little how big is ma he mandrel he was only about this big and Your painting makes with, him look huge. With two females who were equally scrawny and undernourished, and I got to help fatten them up so that they were. I was always bringing them extra treats, and we call it enrichment. So that you know they're getting things because they're so intelligent. Mm -hmm. Part of making them thrive is making sure that they have stimulating things and things to figure out and. Um, things that make them climb more and investigate more and are they food. naturally curious oh extremely wow. they they desperately need it as every bit as much as a, a human oh. child but i happened to take a, a shot of dylan where he looked particularly bold and i painted that and i realized that by painting him like that where the painting is mm -hmm. 40 inches square i he has power. You painted one of the females too, didn't mm -hmm. you? Her eyes, Maggie. Maggie. A lot of your eyes, they touch your soul. They're, the eyes are so powerful of all of these primates. Mm. I, one of my favorite paintings is the one where you did a self-portrait <laughs> in the <laughs> eye Kixie. of, of what, what's her name? Kixie. Kixie. Mm -hmm. Tell about that. Well, it, you know, my painting of Kixie is, is about four feet by four feet, and yet in reality she's only about this big. Oh my gosh. And uh, she's an orphan at, um, in South Africa at mm -hmm. a Vervet Monkey Foundation. One of the things about painting them is, first, I always start by painting the eyes because then it's as if they are alive to me mm -hmm. and as if they are sitting with me and I'm no longer alone or lonely. I, I, I'm with them as we're doing their hair and makeup. 
I love it. And, and the hair and makeup is yes. so, the, the attention to detail and, and to see how you progressed using different materials, because what was available when mm -hmm. you were away. Mm -hmm. And then even the gold leaf that you mm -hmm. use yeah. in um, the, the, I call him the, Jesus. The, the, yes. The, <laughs> he the looks one like I Jesus. call witness, yes. Witness. He, yes. he really looks human. Very, very uh, spiritual. Yes, yes. He's like yes. a Byzantine icon. Yeah. Well, it is all about the eyes, mm -hmm. isn't it? I mm -hmm. mean, the eyes are the window to the soul. We, we were lucky because we had your commentary, mm. but even if you weren't speaking, you have such a beautiful didactic labeling system with the stories. It's, it, you really are touched by these eyes of these souls of these beings. It's, it's mm. extraordinary. Thank you. And, my, my mission, my purpose, I realized, because even the painting came about by accident. And I, uh, tell the story. When I, the first time I was at the sanctuary, there was, the villagers had a strike. They were upset with the government uh, over some land settlement, and the sanctuary happened to be the place, and they, the signage got, the existing signage that was there got mm -hmm. destroyed. So a volunteer and I started painting signs, and I was doing the lettering. The other woman was doing the, the prime, the gorilla faces, and the manager said, "Can you paint a monkey?" And the other woman said, "I only paint apes," and I, How I was in love only with paint <laughs> apes, and I was in love with my little monkey, so I, I painted her. <laughs> I said, "I'm happy to give it a try." Oh, I love it. And when she saw my painting, she said. What, would you paint a mandrel? I said, happy to, let me try that. Oh my gosh. And then I've, I've been painting ever since. So I paint uh, all the signage and I paint murals, I paint portraits and billboards at all the sanctuaries I visit. I call myself the gorilla, gorilla artist. You've left your mark there. How, how long has this journey been for you? Mm -hmm. Since 2007. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it, and, it has uh, been. Yes. And, and you know, until my show went up at, at Gensler on July 6th, mm -hmm. I, I had never seen a single painting of mine on a wall, like my art paintings. It was, they were all in. It, and they were never in one place. Oh so my gosh. So seeing it up at that show was the first time I've seen my body of work mm -hmm. together and my my friend calls it my traveling monkey shrine. <laughs> if you have a chance and you are in New York City, please contact Robin. You have to see the show. It's at Rockefeller Center. But for those of you, after the show is over, uh, Robin has a website, and she. this show is a show that needs to be seen across the world. And so if you have a gallery or you're a museum, because this is not just an art show. This is a show with a mission. And so everything I do, I'm kind of bumble along and learn as I go. So, um, and, and they started being large because I realized I was, I was painting at the home of some friends and it was my first art painting, I right. had decided. The others, the signs at the sanctuaries, but I, had, I sketched it out on a canvas and it was about this big and I held it up for my friends and I said, oh, I'm, I've started my painting. Wow. And they and they looked at it and they were very puzzled and tilted their heads and I said, "What?" And they said, "Well, we thought it was going to be big, like the size of the picture window, because she's like pop art." And she's I, like pop art. She is like pop art. It is. It was a dialogue. I mean, mm -hmm. When I when you brought me upstairs and I saw those two eyes behind the reception <laughs> desk, I was in love. I was like. <laughs> I, th they touched my soul. They were just fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, for kids to learn oh. the stories of these people at a younger age so that we have respect for the animals, we have respect for animals in the wild, and mm -hmm. that they're not just pets, and they're, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that it's not just for us. Well, we're their toys. Actually, I don't worry about the children because they seem directly connected to the animals. Mm -hmm. It's as if they are more pure. Mm -hmm. And I've had children as young as six who I've presented to, and three years later, the child asked me when they see me again, oh, are we going to see pictures of Yoda? I, I think that speaks volumes, too, about the arts. And you know, they keep cutting mm. funding for the arts. And 
the arts are really what can change the world. And here is a perfect example of you reaching into your, the depth of your soul and using your gifts to tell a story, to tell their story, and to educate and change their lives, and as well as changing people's perception. Mm -hmm. What are some of, if someone wanted to be a, a gorilla or a primate surrogate, mm -hmm. what are some places that you would recommend that they start? The first thing I'd like to clarify is that one shouldn't go to a sanctuary just planning to hug a gorilla. No, or, of or, course not. No. It's a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. and it's it's a commitment, and it's so much more holistic. And in fact, over the years, even the handling of the primate orphans by white foreigners mm -hmm. is less and less. Mm -hmm. Be prepared to put in a lot of hard work, and you'll be closer to them, the animals, than you probably would be anywhere else, mm -hmm. but it is not about the bragging rights to holding, holding them. Right. It's about the nurturing and whatever it takes. And the thing is, no matter what I do at those sanctuaries, whether it's clearing out a container of fermented bananas oh, no. <laughs> to sorting 5,000 avocados to digging a pit, it's all None of it feels like work. Oh. Well, you've for, worked for so many yes, sanctuaries and, for um, different um, for different organizations. Yes, mostly in Africa mm -hmm. and the U.S. And they can all use volunteers, mm -hmm. um, but volunteers that have really good intentions mm -hmm. of working hard. Oh, Robin, you have to tell about the bearded lady. Jimmy Jimmy. Jimmy Jimmy. And she's really a girl. <laughs> yes. Yes, she is. <laughs> she looks like those carnival. She's so magnificent. Yeah. <laughs> she's She was the second monkey that I took care of. She's called a de Brazos monkey, and they have this fascinating kind of crown and helmet and a very long, beautiful, creamy colored beard. Oh, I love it. And she sounds sort of like a duck. When you call <laughs> her name, she's wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> they all have these different personalities. Yeah. You have to go see Robin's show, Robin Huffman. What's your website? www.robinhuffmanart.com. It's showing until September 16. 16th in New York City, and hopefully it'll come to a city near you all around the world <laughs> because th these paintings are so powerful. Robin, thank you so much. Mm, my pleasure. Glenn. Thank you. Thanks. Join us next week for Secrets of the Stage. I'm Quinn Lemley. Have a great week.